the better outcomes you're gonna get. If you know exactly what you're dealing with and sperm DNA fragmentation, semen analysis, everything that has to do with male factor and fertility testing is relatively easy, accessible, and affordable. You don't want to put the female through the whole IVF cycle if the problem is within the male, right? If you can fix the male factor of fertility with either medication or surgery, what have you, then you can just fix the sperm, improve it, get it back to normal, and then you can try attempt natural conception. If this is unsuccessful, then you go to the next level. So I think people are used to being overly aggressive and overly treating women for like multicultural and social reasons. I think we need to change that. We need to change this conception around not only patients, some physicians are very traditional than thinking, let's bypass everything that's easy. I think these podcasts are very important in trying to change the whole discussion and conversation around the whole male and female fertility. Welcome to the Egg Whisperer Show. I have Dr. Rami Gaida on today. Welcome back, Rami. Thank you so much for having me. Always a pleasure being here. I don't feel like we talk about sperm enough, and there's no one better to talk about sperm than a reproductive urologist. So thank you for joining us again. And the title of today's talk is Sperm DNA Fragmentation Testing, the latest tests and tools for abnormal sperm testing. Dr. Gaida is an experienced urologist who has a long history of working in the higher education industry. His specialties include urology, andrology, and male infertility. He is currently an assistant professor at University Hospitals in Cleveland, Ohio, and the chief medical officer at Legacy, a company that is literally revolutionizing how men and couples test and free sperm from home. You have to tell us more about that. And I'm delighted to have him join me today to talk about sperm, the importance of sperm DNA fragmentation testing, how sperm abnormalities are diagnosed, how to improve sperm health, and of course, new tests to consider. Welcome back, Rami. Thank you, thank you for having me. We're 50% of the equation. I think we should be 50% of the discussion, right? We know that we are responsible for about 50% of infertility cases. So it's always good being here, trying to shift the blame away from the female and then trying to have these like very educational discussion and conversation just to educate people and raise awareness about the role of the man and the sperm in the whole journey of fertility. Rami, I think that your parents really meant to name you Amy. Rami, Amy, literally. I don't know. You should talk to them about it because I feel the same way. And especially as more and more people are freezing their eggs and then they're going back to thawing their eggs. I'm like, people, you have to do advanced sperm testing and you guys make it easy for them to do it. You don't want to learn the hard way after you quote unquote, put your eggs all in one basket and then did an egg thaw or even did an egg retrieval to find out that maybe you should have paid more attention to that 50%. So I couldn't agree more. I think we live in a very exciting times. We have now more access that's way affordable than before for productive care for female and for the male. So it's very important for people, patients and like society at large to know their options and like to be educated about what can they do to improve, to test, and to make sure that the whole journey is the best possible leading to hopefully good outcome. Well, let's get right into that then. Let's talk about the different ways that sperm can be tested. Tell us about them. Sperm is the smallest cell of the human body. The egg is the biggest cell, right? Let's start there. <laughs> so you have a clear advantage over man. However, the main function of the sperm is to carry this genetic material that's encapsulated in the head of the sperm called the DNA, and then try to go inside of the egg, release the DNA fragmentation for fertilization to happen. Traditionally, for over maybe 50 years, 70 years, the main testing for sperm and male factor infertility was relying on the traditional semen parameters, meaning that the people and andrologists were only checking the quality and the quantity of the sperm, that's it. So with the traditional semen analysis, you have the volume, how much sperm and semen fluid you have, you have the concentration, the motility, how fast the sperm can swim, you have the morphology. So you can calculate something called the total motile sperm count, which has been correlated closely with success of fertility, whether natural conception or ART, assisted reproductive techniques. So nowadays with all these medical advances, technological advances, we have more ways to test for sperm and male factor infertility. We have more data points. We have something called 
functional test for the sperm. Like we try to assess how is the function of the sperm? Is it able to penetrate the egg? Is it able to fertilize it? However, these SARS are expensive. They need very highly trained technician. So they have fallen off like the labs nowadays. The next new thing that's on the market now is DNA fragmentation. So basically, DNA fragmentation looks at the integrity of DNA. So how good is the DNA inside of the head, sper sperm head? Because this has been correlated very closely to miscarriages, to very bad IVF outcomes, to very prolonged period of natural conception. So it's very important to have this additional data point alongside the quality, the quantity. We need to know, is this sperm carrying a good DNA to be able to fertilize the egg or not? And this is one of the indicators now. And when do you think it should be checked and why? So this is a very tricky question because traditionally in the guidelines, like in the AUA guidelines, ASRM guidelines, all the European guidelines, we don't have a clear timeline on when to check it. However, because it's more accessible and it's cheaper, like some companies like Legacy, for example, are doing it from at home, it's mail-in, you don't have to pay a lot of money. So it's more available and accessible to people. But anyways, the rule is if you have recurrent miscarriages, if it's taking you a lot of time to naturally conceive, or if you have bad outcomes from IVF, IUI, or ICSI, then you need to dig deeper into the DNA fragmentation of the sperm just to know if there's anything out there you can fix. I would say also, if you're trying to figure out what the best treatment type is for you, doing the test is something that I suggest to my patients. It is not mandatory to do, but it's part of my conversation with new patients if they haven't done this testing before. Even if they've never had any of those worst case scenarios that you've talked about, I always say the more you know, the better things will go. And there's nothing wrong with having a guy eat healthy, sleep better, drink water, stop smoking. Yes, I mean the THC also, stop doing that. So I appreciate you saying all those things. We'll get into more about the legacy test too, but tell us more about how you actually do the test. Like how does the testing actually work? So we have different ways of testing DNA fragmentation. It all depends on the technique of the, uh, and the availability of the lab. At Legacy specifically, we use a specific test called the SCD or the HALO test. So basically, we're just checking how much denaturation there is in the head of the sperm. It's like a very technical term. However, we have so many other ways, like a tunnel testing, like comet testing, SCD, SCSA. So these are all different labs to test the same thing. The only caveat here is we don't have one reference range. So because this test is relatively new, we've been using it over the last 10 years, we don't have a cutoff or like a reference range. Usually people and scientists would say anything over 30%, meaning you have 30% of your total DNA that's fragmented is not good. So anything more than 30% is considered positive for DNA fragmentation and might be correlated with poorer outcome. And I know a lot of people are wondering, well, okay, so you have that result. What does it actually mean? clinically? So that, that's a great question. This is a reflection that's something that's not right going on inside of the whole sperm formation, right? So we divide these etiology or reason for a high DNA fragmentation test into extrinsic and intrinsic. Extrinsic meaning that the patient has the ability to control these symptoms, right? It's all lifestyle, as you mentioned, alcohol, high BMI, smoking, exposure to pollution, Everything that's bad for your whole body, for your being, is bad for sperm. This is the golden rule I tell my patient. Like, if something is good for you, it's going to be good for sperm production. If you eat healthy, a lot of green stuff, no added sugar, no trans fat. If you sleep around seven hours per night, if you exercise a couple of times per week, if you're not super stressed, that's going to be good for sperm and for your overall well-being. Anything that would increase the temperature of your testicle is bad naturally the testicle would sit outside of the body for a specific reason because they like cooler temperature compared to the internal body temperature so for patient who use a jacuzzi saunas very tight underwear for patient who puts their the laptop on their laps for extended period of time this is going to increase the temperature of the scrotum and might lead to increase dna fragmentation and finally smoking excessive alcohol consumption like social alcohol is good it's moderate caffeine is good any marijuana recreational drug is bad for sperm DNA fragmentation test. So this is the external factor. The internal factor could be a medical reason that's leading for the increase in DNA fragmentation. Like for example, varicocele, 
which is a very common condition in man, basically the dilation of the veins around the testicle that will increase more the pressure on the sperm formation, increase the temperature and the blood flow. So many other conditions, like some genetic conditions. So this is why it's very, very important for anyone with abnormal semen DNA fragmentation test to go check with a urologist or a reproductive endocrinologist just to make sure that we're not missing any organic or medical cause that can be corrected. Because once we do some testing, like a physical exam, a scrotal ultrasound, some hormone testing, we might be able to figure out what's the problem there. We might fix it. And then we expect the DNA fragmentation to go back to normals. And what about low testosterone as a cause? So low testosterone is one of the cause for abnormal sperm production and abnormal DNA fragmentation. This is a very important point, especially for people on testosterone placement therapy. The most important hormone for sperm production and sperm health and DNA integrity is internal testosterone. It's the testosterone that's secreted by the testicles themselves. When people are taking external testosterone, like they're injecting TRT or using the androgel or any other type of TRT, the body's gonna perceive that, oh, I have a lot of circulating testosterone. Let me shut down my own production of testosterone. So when you shut down this natural production of testosterone, the sperm production is gonna take a big hit. So you're gonna have a decrease in the semen parameter and the volume, the quality and the quantity, and the DNA fragmentation might also be affected. So it, it's a very, very important topic. Any patient uh, at their productive age trying to conceive should have a really, really like prolonged discussion with their healthcare provider regarding testosterone replacement therapy. Yeah, I agree. And I often suggest to patients to ask their reproductive urologist if there's a role for other drugs, like maybe clomiphene or arimidex. 100%. We have alternatives to boost the internal production of testosterone other than giving external testosterone. And these are usually safe for fertility. So this is a great alternative. Yeah. And I have been using a sperm chip. It's called the Zymont chip. And I like to talk about stuff just because I talk about it doesn't mean that your doctor has to use it. And there's so many other ways of reducing sperm DNA fragmentation in the lab. For example, if you're doing ICSI or going through IVF. Let's talk about a few of those things. So Teza, Zyma, and Pixi. So what do you think about those, that a different approach in terms of what you do with the sperm on the day of your egg retrieval? So this is part of the exciting journey in andrology. We're trying our best to find ways to mimic natural selection, right? We're trying to optimize what's the best sperm. Like how can we find the best sperm out there? And Zyma is one of the ways just Imagine it as a marathon of sperm, like you're putting all of these sperm together and you're just telling them run and whoever is faster, you're going to catch it at the end at the finish line, isolate it and use it for ART, like ICSI, for example. So we're trying to select the best fastest sperm because the idea is, and the hypothesis is the best sperm has the highest chance of fertilizing the egg, right? And Zymoth is one way of doing it. Pixie is another way. So Pixie is when you put the sperm in hyaluronic acid. So we know that sperm who's trying to fertilize the egg should penetrate the very thick capsule of the egg. And by doing this, it should attach to the egg. So we're trying beforehand to pre-select the sperm that's been able to doing so with the best ability to penetrate this egg. So what we do is we put hyaluronic acid, this chemical, we put sperm, and we isolate the sperm that's linked together. And the, the hypothesis also, this is the ultimate sperm that's the strongest and it's going to be able to fertilize the egg. TASA is a different story. So we know now we have some evidence saying that sperm will increase its DNA fragmentation along the way. So when you have the factor itself, which is the testicle, you have the lowest DNA fragmentation index. So the closer you are to the factory, the better sperm from a quality and quantity perspective you're going to have. So this is why rather than taking sperm from the ejaculate after they traveled from like the testicle to the epididymis, which is the small tube, to the vas, to the outside, you're just going directly to the factor itself and you're just aspirating some sperm from there. The idea also is that you're going to get the best quality sperm from the factory. So all of these factors are trying to decrease the subjectivity in selecting sperm. The technician out there is looking under the microscope and thinking what's the best outcome I can have by selecting the best, fastest sperm that's able to connect to the egg. And these are ways that can help. I think this is the beginning of a very exciting era in andrology and IVF. 
10 years down the line, I think things will be even way better and more specific. So I'm very excited to be here. And I'm excited to have you here too, because I think we're very like-minded. One of the things that I hear from other patients is that they bring these suggestions to their doctor. I'd like to check my partner's sperm DNA fragmentation. And they say, it doesn't matter. Just do IVF. I don't believe in it. Yeah, you're shaking your head too. And I'm like, of course it matters. This is another data point. The more the merrier, like the more information you have, the better outcomes you're going to get. If you know exactly what you're dealing with and sperm DNA fragmentation, semen analysis, everything that has to do with male factor infertility testing is relatively easy, accessible, and affordable. So this should be used in parallel for any testing for the female and should precede any final decision over IVF and ICSI because you don't want to put the female through the whole IVF cycle if the problem is within the male, right? If you can fix the male factor of fertility with either medication or surgery, what have you, then you can just fix the sperm, improve it, get it back to normal, and then you can try attempt natural conception. If this is unsuccessful, then you go to the next level. So I think people are used to being overly aggressive and overly treating women for like multicultural and social reasons. I think we need to change that. We need to change this conception around not only patients, some physicians are very traditional than thinking, let's bypass everything that's easy. I think these podcasts are very important in trying to change the whole discussion and conversation around the whole male and female fertility. I agree, because then patients will bring these topics up with their doctors. And now you guys make it really easy to order the test for people. And I always tell patients, you can do this test yourself. You just go to the legacy website. You can order a DNA fragmentation test. It's as simple as that. I want to talk a little bit about vitamins and supplements. So if you were a guy that had an abnormal sperm DNA fragmentation test, what are the best things that you should be taking right now from a supplement standpoint? That's a loaded question. We don't know. <laughs> we have some evidence that using antioxidant is able to counteract the oxidative stress leading to high DNA fragmentation and decline in the quality and quantity of the sperm. So we know that if a male patient is taking some antioxidants and vitamins, this might help ultimately improving the quality and the quantity of the sperm and getting the DNA fragmentation index back to normal. The caveat here and the problem is we don't have big randomized control trial on which is best. We know that multivitamins like vitamin E, vitamin C, vitamin D, L-carnitine, L-arginine, folic acid, they're all great. We don't know the exact dose, like any multivitamin should be good. I would say one of my favorite is something called CoQ10. So CoQ10 has the highest level of evidence that's showing people who took CoQ10 versus people who took placebo showed an improvement in the semen parameter. So I always tell my patient, take any multivitamins you want, just make sure that you're, it includes CoQ10 300 milligram per day. So this is like the short answer. The long answer is we need a lot more more studies to figure out which is the best antioxidant to use. What you say is exactly what I share as well. I say, take something like Conception XR, add CoQ10. I also say fish oil and vitamin D. So those are the things that I tell patients to take at their new patient appointment from the very beginning to improve things so that people have the best chance of getting pregnant without my help. And if they need a little bit of my help, hopefully we'll be successful the first time. I know that doesn't always work. The sperm cycle is 74 days. So any change that they do in their lifestyle, whether they're taking a supplement, a vitamin, or doing any surgery, they have to wait for a couple of sperm cycles to see any effects. So let's say they're taking this CoQ10, they should test in probably three to six months just to give time for the sperm cycle, like to recover, to have a new sperm, mature sperm, and see if they had any improvement. So this process, it, it will take so much time. So as you said, it should be one of the first thing that people would do is change their lifestyle because they have control over this. Like they can change their lifestyle. They can be more conscious about what they eat, their weight, their lifestyle, and they can start these vitamins while waiting for other more advanced testing. So what I say is, listen, your children are not going to have children until they're 50 years old. So if you take your age now at 50, you need to live that long to see your grandchildren. So you need to start thinking about those things before you even get pregnant so you can live as long as possible. Because look at this world. We don't want to leave our children behind. We want to be here to support them as long as we can. 
And most of my patients are over 40. So I'm like, look, we got to start working on this lifestyle stuff now. It's very important. I agree. We have a trend of advanced paternal aging. We have people more and more wanting babies, natural conception, ART after their 40s. And this is a new trend. Like usually, traditionally, we had people in their 30s. The average was, I think, 33 or 34. Now the average is more 38. So people are wanting more children when they're a bit older, which is very, very important going back to what you said about testing, about changing their lifestyle and planning the whole journey. This is something that you need to put active energy into it. It's not going to happen. Most people, it can happen naturally and like very easily, but you need to be conscious about the whole journey. I don't know if Legacy knows I sing as well. I, I will spare you my song, but if you guys want to pay me for the rights to the song, it's called, It's Always Nice to Have Sperm on Ice. I'll be happy to license it to you guys and literally sing it from the top of my lungs because I, I will be asking my sons to freeze their sperm in their 20s just so that when they're ready to have children in their late 30s, they have the opportunity to use younger sperm if they want. I complete, completely agree. The younger you are, the younger is your sperm, the healthier, the better. You might not use them, but if in case you need them, like you don't know what's going to happen in your life. Is it going to be an accident, chemotherapy? some major life event, you have an insurance policy that's affordable, that's ready for you, that will give you so many other options. So I am 100% agreeing with you. Talk to me a little bit about how Legacy can help people with that, because they can, right? With sperm freezing as well. So Legacy is a digital fertility clinic. At this point, I think we're testing freezing more sperm than anyone in the nation. It's like we have like probably 25,000 sample so far. It's an easy, affordable, accessible way of testing, freezing, and improving sperm. So we have multivitamins. We have now an STI testing. You have access to a telehealth consultation where people can just help explain the journey, the sperm cycle, anything that, any question around sperm. We can provide that in a very accessible, client-friendly way. So I'm very excited to be working both at an academic setting, but also at a startup that's trying to change the whole field, because I think this is a revolution and we're part of this driver to hopefully better outcomes, better success, helping people conceive it. And have healthier families. That's the goal is just teaching people what they can do from the beginning. So what's next in the future? Like I imagine like a little robot or some sort of thing I can tie to a sperm cell and then I can take a robot and I can be outside the body, obviously, and then take that sperm cell and then watch it inside the fallopian tube and then put the sperm in an egg. It might be. The idea is, I think that the future is AI, artificial intelligence. At some point, we're going to have an algorithm that would take all of this data that we have, the semen quality, quantity, uh, sperm DNA fragmentation, the pixie, the zymot, all the information that we have is going to be into one algorithm and hopefully we're going to be able to select the real best sperm to use for ICSI to try to increase the chances of ART. So I think we're going to be able to be more specific and more accurate in the whole process. I'm also very, very excited about all the genetic testing and genetic therapy that are coming. So now more and more, I have more faith that we're going to be able to treat so many people with azosperm like people who don't have any sperm because of some genetic mutation or a combination, I think the future is bright for these type of patients because we will hopefully be able to change some genetic coding and hopefully getting some sperm out of it. So it's a very exciting time. Wow. I can just think of the families that would benefit from that technology. So I hope you're right. I really do. Well, thank you, Rami. Thank you for coming on today. Thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure. Is there anything else you want to add? I'm available 24 seven, like any question, any concern. They can reach me through my email via yeah, legacy. I'm like, my passion is to raise awareness, educate people, answer their questions. So I'll be more than happy to answer anything. Thank you again. Thank you for doing that. And thank you for sharing your knowledge and wisdom with me today. And for all our listeners, I know that they're going to learn so much and hopefully they'll get over to that legacy site and see if there's a test or something that they might want to do before they start their journey to parenthood, or even if they're already in IVF, maybe they'll benefit from learning more. So thank you again. Thank you for having me.